Hello, my name is Cole Preston. Today I'm coming to you with an update on craft grow licenses in cannabis. I'll be telling you how you can support the legalization of psilocybin. And I'll also tell you how you can support the removal of the odor proof language in the cannabis law, which is often used as a skeleton key by law enforcement to basically get into your vehicle and violate your rights. So if you're unfamiliar with that last idea that I just spoke about, check out episode number 253 featuring criminal defense attorney Evan Bruno. He's very familiar with this topic because he continues to defend individuals like you and me to this day. For the simple possession of cannabis. And it all starts with police claiming they can smell cannabis in your vehicle. What a wacky place we live in today. So we'll get back to that topic today. We're going to start with the Cure Act. So in case you didn't know, the Cure Act would legalize. Um, it would create a regulated structure for the supported adult use of psilocybin, and it would also deschedule psilocybin, which would effectively make it legal to possess, cultivate, and use. You could also gift it, which is pretty cool. It would effectively remove psilocybin from the list of controlled substances in the state of Illinois, which I should say is further than we went with cannabis. If you didn't know, in 1978, the original penalties for cannabis were established in the 1978 Cannabis Control Act of Illinois. If you've not heard of this, check out episode number 232 of our podcast. We did, we did a deep dive into the history of cannabis in Illinois. We've got a document that I'm showing on the screen right now that has citations for basically everything, including the last thing that I just said. So like I said, this goes further than we ever went with cannabis. Most of the penalties that were established in 1978 for cannabis still exist to this day, post-legalization. Legalization really didn't do much for cannabis. But this seems to do everything we would want for cannabis except for psilocybin. Look, the regulated structure is interesting, to say the least. I would recommend if you want to learn more about the regulated structure to check out the last few episodes of the Chillinoy podcast. I released an episode number 261 with Julia Ellis. I released another episode number 259 with Ville Marie. And um, I released another episode looking for the number on that one right now. Uh, da, 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 number 249 with Nathan Gates. So if you want to hear what the regulated structure looks like, check out those episodes. I'm coming at you today because I wanted to teach you how you can show your support for these bills. And it's pretty simple. Uh, first of all, I think you should reach out to your local representatives and say that, hey, I really dig this bill. Or in other words, I really support this bill. Um, reach out, say that clearly, and encourage them to also signify support for this bill. It's House Bill 1, the Cure Act. Encourage them to co-sponsor the bill, right? That's first and foremost, I think, what you should do. Reach out to your representative. Secondly, you should fill out a witness slip as a proponent for this bill. It's super easy. I'm, I'm displaying the witness slip right now, you know, so you can put in Cole Preston. That's me. You'll obviously put in your name. I've already, re I've already signed as a proponent. You can see my name as a proponent. Um, example, address, right? It's super easy to fill this out. Fill it out as a proponent. And um, if you need instructions, by the way, we'll have instructions in the podcast description. So there will be a link to instructions on how to fit fill out a witness slip. And there will be a link to this witness slip for House Bill 1. So it's really important that you fill out a witness slip. People are doing it. In fact, earlier today, we shared on social media that you should do it because at the time, the opponents 
vastly outweighed the proponents. Currently, that is still the case. I'm sharing my screen. You can see that there are 286 proponents. So that's larger than it was earlier this morning. Uh, 10 a.m. is when I checked last. Um, so that number has grown pretty well. The number of opponents has also grown, unfortunately. And you guessed it. On the list of opponents are members of the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police. And there are other law enforcement groups that have signed on. There are religious groups. So it looks like members of the Vineyard Church. I think the other group is First Christian National Association or something. Uh, here you can see the Illinois Sheriff's Association is signed on as an opponent. Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police. I don't know if that was one I already read. But you can see that the oh concerned Christian Americans looks like Reverend Bob Bosch signed on. I'd love to talk to you, Bob Robert. Is that what you go by? Hey, um, so seriously, this you know this this helps. There's a hearing coming up for this bill, and they will basically show a tally of who is a proponent and who is up an opponent, and it would be great. If everybody that's listening right now can can uh, file a witness slip as a proponent, because then this bill might see the light of day. I think I think I support it, and uh, I'm encouraging you to do your own research to see if you support it. I've done, like I said, plenty of interviews at this point. Um, I listed off those episode numbers. I'm I'm not going to do it again. I can put a link in the podcast description though for you. If you want to learn more before you um, submit a witness slip signifying your support, I think it is important that you do your own research, uh, but do please keep in mind that it looks like it's slated for a hearing on March 8th. So try to get your research in before then. There's no guarantee it's going to be called then by any means, um, but just, you know, try to try to do the research if you have the time. So. Let's see. So the Cure Act. So the Cure Act is not the only thing that will be heard on the potentially. Uh, there's a hearing on March eighth where these bills will potentially be reviewed for the public, and things like this will be taken into account. I'm going to share my screen really quick to show you how I find this information. I'll put this link in the podcast description as well. If you go to, so if you're on this website, which again, I'll have this link in the podcast description and you go to house and then you go to committee hearings, you can see that on the eighth, if I scroll down, there's an executive committee hearing. If I look here, you can see the Illinois Cure Act is first on the list. Now, whether or not it'll actually be called first on the list is, is open question. Because frankly, there was supposed to be a hearing yesterday, and the Cure Act was first on the list for it. And from what I've been told, it was not called. Um, so it looks like electronic witness slips can be submitted up to the conclusion of the committee hearing. So that's good to know. Uh, once again, this is going to be – this was posted today, it looks like, at 831, but it's going to be on March 8th at 10 a.m., in Springfield, Illinois, you can actually show up to this if you wanted to, but this is how you fill out the witness slips. So again, we'll have instructions in the podcast description on how you can specifically fill out witness slips for the CURE Act, but those same instructions can be applied to anything. And I would encourage you to file witness slips for these other, uh, for these other bills. Some of these bills are good. For example, 1206, I mentioned that we discussed this topic with Evan Bruno in episode number 253, he helped to draft this bill. And I know for a fact that this is a problem. Now, I'm going to encourage you to research this first. Listen to episode number 253. It's available for streaming everywhere right now. Ver get yourself up to speed on this particular topic. And I need you to <laughs> um, consider whether or not it's worth your support. I think it is because it would, it would remove odor-proof language from the vehicle code, which is what is getting everybody in trouble now. With that said, 
we're actually sitting pretty we're we're sitting in a good place for this bill at least. So you'll recall that House Bill 1 has 286 proponents, that means people for the bill, and 577 opponents at the time of this recording. Um so the opponents are vastly outweighing the proponents. So let's look at House Bill 1206, which again would remove the odor-proof language from the vehicle code. If you look, I'm showing you how you can find this information, folks. If you're watching, um, if you're listening, it's and you'd like to watch, the link is chillinoy.net slash video. So if you're on the bill, um, House Bill 1206, which I can back up and show you how I even found that bill. If you go to ilga.gov, and then it's, you know, you go to bills and resolutions here on this side. And then and who knows if they're going to change this website. It does seem pretty archaic. So if we're looking for 1206, I'm going to go into 1201 through 1300. And there you can see 1206. I'm pulling up 1206, which is the bill that Evan, our guest from episode number 253, helped to draft. Definitely check that episode out. Now, if you go to witness slips, this is how you can see the tally. Now, this is we're sitting in a pretty good place right now. There are four proponents, one person off of the Illinois State Bar Association. I don't know who these other people are. They're representing themselves. The opponents, the people that propose the bill, believe it or not, are all law enforcement. Look at that. Everybody that opposes the this bill is law enforcement. I wonder why. Look, there are only four proponents. There are three opponents. This is a bill that could use your support. Once again, uh, you can find this bill on the committee hearing website, and then you can file a witness slip for it. Use those same instructions, honestly, for the, the that we gave you for the Cure Act to fill out this witness slip. We'll have a link in the podcast description for this witness slip. Um, it would definitely be a good idea, I think, to try to outweigh law enforcement on this issue. Um I'm just saying, you know, uh, we could we could really show a sign of support. Uh, and so once again, the link for this will be in the podcast description um, and you can show your support that way. That's not the only way you should so show your support. I want to remind you that you should also reach out to your representatives and tell them that you support this bill and tell them that they should signify support for this bill vocally. Um, but also by sponsoring this bill. So just wanted to show you one more bill before we get out of here, uh, and then we'll talk about craft the craft grow extension. But you know, check this out, for example. This House Bill 1090 is cannabis possession, not criminal. I think it's a good bill that would would I think it deserves your support. I from what I'm able to gather. This bill, along with another bill that Mayor Representative Flowers has filed, would actually remove criminal penalties for cannabis. That goes back to what I started this show with, the fact that most most criminal penalties remain. If you take a look at the witness slips, there are seven proponents and just about 420 opponents. And among those opponents are members of law enforcement. No surprise there. Another bill that I wanted to show... Well, hmm, I may not be, I don't think I have it pulled up, unfortunately, right now, but it is also pretty surprising to see. Just I took a glance at some of the craft grow bills, which I told, which if you've been watching the show, I've covered those bills. And I'm not against those bills, but I'm also not necessarily for those bills. I fundamentally believe that we need to address things like the decriminalization of cannabis and the legalization of home grow for everybody first. Um, but you know, I'm not saying we can't walk and chew bubble gum, but here's the thing. It's kind of crazy to see how many people are opposing that bill, just opposing it. And it, there's of course law enforcement in that group as well. Okay. Uh, speaking of craft growers, uh, there has been an extension to a deadline for craft growers. Now, from what I understand, we'll listen to this report from WBEZ. There was a deadline approaching, and if the craft grower – so craft growers have been awarded licenses in Illinois, but I think only one has opened up doors officially. 
maybe two or three at this point. I'm not exactly sure. But the point is, it's a low number. And this deadline has been approaching. And what I believe the deadline meant, if you hadn't opened doors at that time, then you had to like give your license up or it was t- revoked, I-, I think. But let's listen to this report. Maybe it'll tell us a little bit more. We'll have a link to this report in the podcast description. Craft cannabis growers, transporters, and infusers in Illinois can breathe a sigh of relief for now. They were supposed to be ready to start business yesterday, but the state agriculture department issued an extension that now gives these businesses until next year to get things in order. As WBEZ's Alex Degman tells us, some see it as a reprieve, but most are still worried. Illinois' craft cannabis industry is pretty small. So an event full of people in it is almost like a family reunion with vibes. The Illinois Independent Craft Growers Association and the Social Equity Empowerment Network put on a symposium this week to bring everyone together to share stories, get advice, and hopefully make connections. But the event at the South Shore Cultural Center in Chicago was like the type of family reunion with a big elephant in the room. Instead of worrying about when their uncle will make an inappropriate joke, the Kraft Cannabis family wonders about deadlines and whether they'll survive. The 2024 extension is good news for people like Crystal Anderson. Oh my God, yes, it's a big relief for us. And it's not that we have stopped working because we're still trudging along and doing things that we have to do to, um, to stand this business up. A nurse anesthetist by day, Anderson's trying to open a dispensary in DeKalb in a craft grow facility in Kankakee. She also has a transporter license. It was still a brighter room than it might have been a month ago before the extension. Depending on when you got your license, you now have until either February or December of next year. The state says COVID-19 and supply chain issues led to the extension, even though just weeks prior, there were no plans for such a move. Like many in the social equity cannabis space, Anderson has had problems fundraising, but she says she's close. It's almost like the Illinois market has dried up you know, when it comes to funding, um, but you know, we've had some good leads. Um, my group have, and we're just hoping that you know they follow, they you know fall in place, and we're able to do it. Illinois created these social equity craft licenses to help people with past marijuana offenses break into the industry on a smaller scale, particularly Black and Brown folks. But access to capital and money from state loan programs are difficult to get. Felicia Royster co-founded the Social Equity Empowerment Network, or SCENE, in Chicago. It tries to address the racial wealth gap by fostering more Black-owned businesses. Royster appreciates the deadline extension because she's also trying to open a craft grow, but she still needs investors and a location. We're now three years into this struggle and we have, you know, um, no resources. So we're in a we're in a unique time right now where it's a volatile market. People are not looking at, at cannabis because they're worried about what's going to happen in a recession. It's another sign that in this industry, money rules almost everything. We talked to Reese Xavier about that a few months ago. The CEO and managing partner of HT23 Growers in South Suburban Chicago Heights says he's gotten some attention lately, but he's acting like there is no extension. I'm of the opinion that you can't take your foot off the gas, whether it's an extension or not, because what will happen is if you take your foot off the gas, you stop pressing for those funds, you stop pressing to get all the things that you need in place to become operational, the, the year goes by like that. I got my license in 2021. It feels like yesterday. Xavier expects his project to cost around $9 million. He's trying to convert a bacon strip mall into a complex with a grow facility, a dispensary, a kitchen, and a consumption lounge. He's building out slowly as he waits for money from the state to come in, which he's confident will. In the meantime, he wants to talk to state lawmakers. He doesn't think craft cannabis license holders are involved enough in charting a path forward. I can sit down, I can tell you every hurdle I've been through to date, and I'm confident there'll be a lot more. I can sit down and tell you all the challenges that we receive financially. No one has better experience and knowledge about that than the folks who are going through it. Most craft cannabis license holders, including almost everyone at the South Shore Cultural Center, are still going through it, and that will continue for the foreseeable future. There may be a little breathing room now with the deadline extension, but without money and legislative fixes, soon the relief will be short-lived. Alex Degman, WBEZ News. All right. Once again, we'll have the link to that story in the podcast description. I hope you found value in this episode of the Chillinois podcast. We'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye.